So I have to say, I do feel very privileged to be here today. So thank you to the organizers for inviting me and thank you all to hang on till the end of the day. Um, I'll start with a little introduction about me just for some context of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so my name is Trina butler Lavery, and uh, I'm from Ireland, a place called County Tipperary. I grew up in the countryside there uh, with lots of green fields to play in. And I studied in Ireland. I did an undergrad in communication studies and then went on to do a master's in kind of interaction design, HCI space, and worked in Ireland in a small digital design agency for a while. Um, and after that, then I actually came here to London and I did a short stint at Burberry on their digital design team, um, where I had this kind of privilege of being exposed to these really exciting projects like the Art of the Trench, their online store, the run up to a show and the launch of a kind of an autumn winter campaign, which was really exciting for me. And um, Burberry has this amazing heritage of over 160 years in the making. And when I was there, it was kind of 2011 timeframe, which was really interesting. Uh, the leadership at the time was Christopher Bailey and Angela Herendetz. Um, they had this vision of taking Burberry to be this like uh, leading luxury uh, in, in the online space. And so what was really cool to see was how they kind of held this vision for Burberry and then executed it across every touch point from the clothing, the brand, and, and made some really major decisions about the brand. Um, how they brought through experiences in their stores and in their shows, music experiences. And so for me, um, I just, it really had a deep influence on me and I learned a lot about thinking about designing an end-to-end -end experience with a product or a brand. Um, but shortly after that, um, I joined Google almost eight years ago now um, as a designer. And, and in my time at Google, I've worked in kind of three big buckets or areas. Uh, when I first joined, I, I was part of the emerging markets team, um, looking at the needs of customers in places like India, parts of Africa, South America. So I got to do a lot of user research and travel and really try and understand customers in their context and what their needs were. Um, after that, it kinda, um, some of my work led me into the, the home team, which then became Google Nest. And um, there we were creating new products and experiences for the home, like smart speakers and, and Wi-Fi and displays. And um, maybe some of you saw some of the hardware announcements we had yesterday where a couple of more of our new products uh, are now out in the world, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and now I, I'm part of the Google AI team. And so uh, my work with Google has taken me to a couple of different places. I started in Zurich and, and then uh, lived in, and worked in Paris for a while, uh, back to London, then California. But earlier this year, very excitingly for me, I moved back to London and take on this role as, as a UX lead in Google AI in a, in a new part of the team led by Sebastian Bauer. And I have to say, it is really exciting to be in London. Um, and one of the reasons why it's been really great to be here today and be part of this event in general is uh, I feel like I've got to see a little bit more of the local design community and see what you're all inter interested in and focused on, and it's, it's really impressive. Um, so that's my background little bit. And now um, I put together three short stories for you, uh, all related to the theme of today's event around the human and the machine and drawing from, I suppose, my own experience and background. So hopefully you'll find something of interest in, in one of those. Um, so my first story for you, uh, homes, humans and machines. So I as I said, until maybe February, March this year, was living out in California, where I was a UX lead on Google's products for the home for over, just over five years. Um, and I love homes. I love what they mean. I love how they're all different. I love home design. I'm sure many of you do too, and architecture, and uh, things like grand designs and room to improve are like my fave TV shows. Um, but to be able to design products for the home as a UX designer with the level of, I suppose, innovation and rigor and scale that we get to operate at, at Google was just really exciting. And it's been a, an incredible experience. And so during my time there, um, I had the opportunity to build up a UX team and bring to life a suite of products and experiences, things like our Wi-Fi products, smart speakers, displays, and, and also influence our overall smart home strategy and experiences, which we like to think of as um, help, a helpful home or a thoughtful home. Um, oftentimes when we 
in tech and, and myself included talk about building new kind of smart products like these. We talk a lot about the breakthrough technologies that we're wielding in order to do that. And, and that's really important because they present new challenges. Um, for example, the big challenges that voice brings in terms of UI and how you design that. Um, the conversion moments of these new kind of tasks that, that we're um, creating for users or how we create design systems for that to scale. Um, and that's all, all really important. I would say it's kind of the hard graft of, um, of what my team was doing and I'm sure many of you too. And we spent a lot of time uh, together kind of sweating the details, going through the rounds of iteration, the user testing um, and refinements. And I would say that is critical to product success. <coughs> but sometimes that focus alone, and, and when we spend so much time in it, it really does become a focus, can give us these blinkers. And those blinkers can kind of block out the broader context for which that kind of task or product or service will sit within. And so, I suppose sometimes I feel when we in the tech industry are saying human-centered or user-centered, it's true, but maybe it's a little bit more like user-task-centered. And um, that's really important. And it's, as I say, it's where a lot of the, the heavy lifting goes and the time is spent to get those, those task flows right. But it is just a piece of a bigger picture. And so how do we then understand and maintain a relationship between those pieces where we're spending a lot of our time and the bigger picture of where this will sit and that, and that context. And so um, I suppose from my perspective, I believe one of the most powerful tools we have for doing that kind of connection between those two is through human stories. Um, human stories help us as designers maintain a strong connection to the broader context because they connect us to it emotionally. Um, they allow us to stay connected to both the complexities and the simplicities of real everyday life. I've been very lucky in, in all of the work that I've been doing at Google, I've had a great opportunity to do a lot of user research, um, meet people in many different countries and, and meet them in their homes, which is a real privilege. Um, for me, meeting people face to face and hearing their stories is just a really big motivator for me as a as a designer, and I'm sure it is for lots of you. Um, the problem space becomes really crisp and framed and, and it's very motivating and meaningful through those experiences. Uh, I want to tell you about one of, one of those trips. So on one of our field trips to part of the, the south of the US, um, I met this mom and daughter duo. And so it was a single mom who had raised her now adult daughter and they still live together. They love life. They were really bubbly and engaging. And we were doing research at the time on Wi-Fi and connectivity. And I remember, I remember the two of them today and them along with many other users that I've met. I think of them in like the daily work that I do in design, when I was designing products for the home and I'll tell a little bit more of what I'm doing now later. But I remember something very specific to this day that the daughter said to us. Uh, we were chatting about Wi-Fi and routers <laughs> alongside kind of home and life. And uh, we were trying to understand pain points, but also the implications for those on their home life. And um, the daughter just paused for a moment to try and explain this to us. And she said, mom's time is precious. She has worked really hard to raise me. Now it's her time, her time to enjoy life. And what she was calling out to us was so true. Time is precious. And technology should be supporting and empowering her and her mom in their home, not doing the opposite. For them and for a lot of people we talk to, the router, router, the internet box that brings the internet connection into the home was literally a black box of confusion. Um, and sadly leaves people feeling powerless. We met some people and a number of people who are literally afraid to touch that box in case they upset it and they lose the connection that they're lying on, relying on. It, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's also very sad, right? We rely on this uh, service in our home, yet these people don't feel a sense of control over it. Um, and it's adding this kind of low level stress to their, to their home life. And so one thing that was very clear from that particular research trip was home Wi-Fi was a problem that's worth solving. And so we went after tackling all angles of that problem, which led to our uh, suite of Wi-Fi products. But something else came out of that research as well, 
which was, it's not just how technology works and what it can do for people in their home that matters. It highlighted the significance of how technology in the home makes people feel and how that makes them feel affects their experience of their very feeling of home. And so we could see this insight emerging and we could also see the significance of that feeling of control. And so we started to dig deeper into that space. Um, home is a truly special place. I think we can all probably relate to that. But how do we understand home? Uh, if you'll stick with me for just a moment, I'm gonna to have to have you imagine something. So if you can imagine for me now that you are on your way home from work, whatever transport you take, whether it's the bus or the train or your wife walking or biking, and you're getting closer to your home now, and then you see the door and then you put the keys in and you cross into the threshold of your home. Now you're in the physical space of your home. And then maybe you put down your bag or you take off your coat or your shoes. Now you're starting to transition into that kind of psychological and emotional space of home. And I imagine a lot of you can relate to that feeling that we have some days when we like close that door behind us and it's like, thank God I'm home, no matter how good or bad a day it was, right? And so I suppose the point here is that a house is a physical construct, but a home is an emotional one. Um, it's a feeling, a feeling where a corner of the world feels like our own. Um, what we saw in our research is, is kind of this idea that everything we're doing out in the, in the world as our public selves sits on some sort of foundation of what we've created at home. And over time that depletes. And when we go back home, we're, we have this opportunity to recharge and rejuvenate enough to go out and face another day out in the world. And so we all need a space in the world for that. We also found that in order to cultivate that special feeling of home, it relies on three important aspects. And so there's these aspects around comfort and care, but there's also this crucial center, central need that we saw across all different types of home. And that is that feeling of control. To cultivate a sense of home, we need the ability of a feeling of control of the boundaries of it. And so we were able to kind of harness and, and be motivated by these insights around what the home means and how can we try and bring that sense of control to people um, in how we try to approach our, our products and our strategies. So from big decisions like the strategy for why we decided to reimagine and, and, and relaunch the home app to kind of more subtle details of the shades of the fabrics that we were choosing the curves of a Google Nest Mini. <laughs> Got the name right. Um, and with these bigger intentions in view, we also looked across the end-to-end -end customer journey. How could we look at all of these moments and kind of take this lens of those feelings and see how could we use all of these micro moments to kind of help deliver on that? And so I'll pause there for a moment, but. Basically, in, in, in my team, in, in the kind of home space, I told stories like these, stories of what the home means, stories of voices of our customers over and over again um, at any opportunity, basically. So whether it was a VP asked us to present to the whole org or an eng lead invited us to a team meeting, I would kind of squish in these human stories um, before we would present the work as context setting. And uh, sometimes internally, I felt a little bit like a broken record and a little bit sneaky trying to get those in there. Um, but without fail, time and time again, what I would see is that another person would click into this kind of understanding or a group of people who had maybe heard it before would understand it at a deeper level. It really empowered our cross-functional team to understand the importance not only of the work we were doing, but of how we approached it. I, sub I suppose that the point here is it's not just about telling the stories um, and the stories needing to be built out of deep insight, but it's also about retelling them. And that's where good, what good stories are, right? Things that you can retell and pass on and retell. When we start designing then AI powered products and experiences, these human stories become increasingly important because now the consequences of the decisions that we're making can be more far reaching than ever before. And so maintaining that connection between the piece and the broader context is even more important. 
Um, designing in an AI world requires us as designers to take on some new systems thinking. There's some new concepts and language and probably methods that we're going to have to adopt. But one thing it also requires is something that we're all really familiar with in, in all the work that we do. Um, and that is understanding humans and their context and sharing that with our cross-functional partners and frankly anyone who will listen through human stories. Um, and while these stories might not give us the precise solutions always, what they always do do is when we as designers are looking for those solutions, we stay grounded and connected um, to the reality of the humans we're designing for and also connected to our own humanness through that experience. So I'll move on to my next story and they're increasingly shorter as we go through. So stick with me. Um, this one is called Machines Made by Humans. And so I had a realization a couple of years ago now, uh, one of these little moments where things just click for you. And this particular realization was spurred by a talk by Professor Genevieve Bell, who I'll talk more about in a moment. And the realization was this, AI is built by humans. And it's, it's pretty obvious and you probably all already know it. Um, but to be honest, for me at the time, I had been kind of thinking as AI as this mysterious engineering magic in the corner. And, um, but the thing is, AI is a tool. And in the same way our previous technologies and tools have been built, AI too is built and built by humans. It doesn't magically appear. It's made by people and it comes from somewhere. I feel like often when we talk, talk about AI though, we focus on the lore and the hype and also the uncertainty and the confusion that something like AI that will bring so much change naturally brings. If you had a chance to visit the um, AI More Than Human exhibition in the Barbican, that began with a commentary of how people have always been intrigued by the artificial creation of intelligent beings through magic and religion and science and lore. And I suppose through this sort of interest, people have explored their place in the world and what it means to be human. And at the same time, if we look at kind of the discourse and language we often use around AI, we, th we say things like AI will, is got, AI is going to. We put a lot of agency in the hands of this concept of AI. And then we sometimes forget to reference where it comes from, who its authors are. And so I suppose the important thing about some of those um, larger views on, on AI is that it does call out the exponential impact that implementations of AI will have on our world, that's for sure. But it can also feel like AI is bigger than us and beyond our control, almost mysterious. And um, I suppose one problem that I want to highlight for us in, in this room is the impact that that discourse can have on our own sense of agency when engaging with AI. Um, it can feel almost disempowering, as though AI is already beyond our control um, and beyond us. AI has the potential to support humans in so many ways, but it is a tool and it relies on how we shape it and what problems we apply it to. So I had this opportunity to attend a presentation by Professor Genevieve Bell, um, Bell a couple of years back when she was speaking at the Web Directions uh, conference in Sydney. And um, she's an accoladed anthropologist, she's an anthropology background, but has worked in the technology space for many years and was a senior fellow at Intel for some time. She has an amazing set of lectures that have been recorded online in a series called the Boyer Lectures that are well worth checking out where she talks about the role of technology and AI and humans in the future and building our future. This is one of the things that she has said. Um, she really influenced me in that talk to rethink my own relationship with AI at the time. She says, where technology comes from matters because who built it, what they hope for, their assumptions are all embedded within it. So what this calls out is it really matters how we bring a mix of people and skills to approach this challenge. We need voices from across a broad spectrum of fields and cultures. But how do we go about that? So for Belle, she has actually moved back to, Cal to Australia from California to work at the Australian Nat um, National University 
in order to take on a challenge that I find very inspiring. She has said from kind of from what she has seen that in pivotal moments like this throughout our history, they have resulted in and required new bodies of knowledge, new practitioners, and new questions. She has taken on the challenge of building a new applied science to manage the complexity of what's coming with AI, people skilled to manage how we scale AI. Um, and so the, this master's program has started and the first 16 students, I believe, are from all over the world are taking part in it. So it's going to be really intriguing um, to, see, to see where that goes. But this gets at the second point, point, part of this realization that I had. <coughs> AI is built by humans and I'm a human. And I suppose what this kind of meant to me is probably best summarized in the question that it started to raise for me. What is my role in the future of AI? As a designer in tech and as a human, I had to ask myself, what is my contribution here? We are at a huge paradigm shift in computing. And so I had to ask myself, how can I help do something to shape this powerful system in a positive direction of serve, in a positive direction in service of humans and our environment? And at the time, even just having that question floating around in my head just gave me this additional lens to bring to my work. To engage with my cross-functional partners in deeper ways around data flows and models. But ultimately then, when the opportunity came my way to move here to London, to take on a role as a UX lead in the Google AI team, I just felt it was a really great opportunity to go deeper into the space. Um, and hopefully figure out some way to make some small positive dent uh, and not because I feel like I'm, I'm special or that I actually understand enough about this whole space of AI. I don't yet, but rather, uh, I suppose I want to show up as myself as a designer with all of the kind of understanding of humans that I have and their context. And I want to collaborate with experts from all different fields. I want more people like me and I want more people different than me to also show up and engage with this big paradigm shift. I suppose, I believe that in the same way, art is an expression from within. And when you see a piece of art, you see a little glimpse of the artist and who they might be. Products and services are similar. I believe you see little glimpses of their makers through them. AI will be similar. So I suppose my question that I'd like to raise for all of us here today is, how can we intentionally bring ourselves as humans and designers to this challenge? If you're getting kind of started in this space, there's amazing materials out here and Georgina shared some great work. I'd like to highlight two pieces um, for product design coming out of the Google Design Group that you may find useful that, that I use. Um, the first is this uh, People and AI Research Guidebook. Um, and this is a set of work combining principles, patterns, worksheets um, built up from, from our Google AI team and uh, published and, and it's a really interesting resource and a really a great tool basically. And then the second part is um, the ML section within our material guidelines and that continues to grow with more patterns as well um, that you can check out. I feel like a nice way to get started with both of those resources is through these kind of video overviews. So at the top is my colleague Jess Holbrook and he does a really nice um, intro to the People and AI Research Guidebook. That's a great uh, resource to check out. And at the bottom is my friend Canal, who works on the material design team. And he has a really nice overview with um, one of the creative directors, Rachel Bean as well, speaking to how you can apply those ML patterns. So I suppose to, to close this story, to engage in this challenge of the future with AI, not all of us will want to change roles. In fact, I think for many of us, you and for us, by staying where we are, we probably will have the most opportunity for influence. Um, but wherever you are, I, I do hope you'll take some heart in what I've shared here to feel empowered as a designer, and I mean that in the broadest sense of the word, to use your tools and your skills, your experience, and I would say your hopes um, to engage with the future of AI. So my last uh, shorter story for you is uh, beyond humans. And so I suppose while the previous two stories are based on some of the reflections I've had on 
past decisions or work. This one is a little different because it's things I'm actively working on and basically trying to figure out as I go. Um, so I'll share some of the things that I've been noodling on. So as a designer now working in the Google AI team on research, part of my work is about envisioning potential futures for personal computing in an AI world. Um, when I started that, it became clear quite quickly that we do need to consider new architectures and new approaches that can scale for AI. And there's been a lot of work here. I want to share one little example from, um, from our team. At I.O. this year, our CEO, Sundar Pichai, talked about a new technique coming out of efforts in Google AI. Um, and it really challenges the notion that products need more data in order to be more helpful. The technique is called federated learning, and it makes it possible to train AI models and make products smarter without raw data ever leaving an individual device. Um, to help communicate this concept in an accessible way for audiences like developers and designers, my teammates actually published this comic with Scott McLeod and Lucy Bellwood, and it does have corgis for the corgi fans among you, and it walks through how federated learning can work in a kind of a, a human-friendly way. Just for context of an example of federated learning in action, um, Gboard, the Google keyboard in Android, that uses this technique. And so it can learn words like um, Targaryen after th thousands of people type it without Google knowing what any one person is, is, um, is typing with this federated learning process. And so I find it really encouraging and really hopeful that this um, this work is being invested in, and we're continuing to explore more and more AI advancements and architectures that can do things like this, that will make products more helpful while using less data. Um, and also, how do we communicate these new concepts, not only to audiences like this, but also to users in a helpful way? And so there's lots of work to do there. Part of my work right now is looking into ideas around trust in AI systems for the future of this kind of personal computing um, in an AI kind of world. And so the place we started with that was how do you design UI that helps users calibrate their trust around a particular prediction um, or piece of data. And so we've made some good progress on that. And actually the People in AI Research Guidebook that I mentioned has a specific uh, section on explainability and trust and a worksheet. Um, and I'll pause at this point to, to kind of make an obvious point, but having a user-centered design approach is critical um, when working with kind of creating AI-powered products. We need to understand user needs and the problems we're trying to solve and see if AI will provide a unique way of solving that or not. Otherwise, we may end up by creating powerful systems to address a non-existent user need. And where would that end up? But when we started into this trust research, um, we were very much focusing on an end user, which is what we tend to do. Um, but what I realized very quickly when we started to dig into it is there's a lot more at play here than a particular prediction in front of a single user. Actually, by focusing only on an end user, we were not considering the broader system. And in doing so, we saw how we could run the risk in our research that we could potentially overburden a user with explanation. Um, and the weight of the decisions of trust onto the user. And so, as an example, when we go to a grocery store to buy a food product, as a customer, there are signifiers and other participants there that help us understand information about that product. But there's also so much other infrastructure beyond the store and that customer that determines how trust is built in that. Basically, there's a whole system at play. And so, as we started to dig into this system lens, and think about things in that way, the role of the designer starts to look bigger than figuring out the experience and interactions for a single user. It starts to ask us if our design work can consider more broader systems, that it sits within, the industry it's in, society, the environment, cultures, and it, it's really big and challenging um, consideration to kind of extend it that big. So practically, where do we start? I suppose in, in our work to understand trust and kind of and build up some perspectives there, 
um, we decided to see how trust works in other systems. And so we actually worked with Georgina and Projects by IF, um, who spoke just now, on, on some of this research, reviewing literature and meeting with experts in, in many different fields, including aviation and IVF and farming. Um, and ultimately, what, it, what, we, what we learned about these other systems um, emerged through these kind of like system maps. Um, and what we saw here, we started to see like the components of those systems, but I suppose more importantly, the operations that flow across these systems, what makes them work. And so in our work now, we're trying to see how can we move our design approach intentionally to consider more of this system thinking framework. In his provocative piece on a designer's code of ethics, Mike Montero says, Design does not exist in a vacuum. Society is the biggest system we can impact, and everything you do is part of that system, good and bad. Ultimately, we must judge the value of our work based on that impact. And so if we think about these systems, um, the question on my mind right now is, how do we extend beyond user-centered design to a design approach that incorporates the broader context of the systems we're impacting in a manageable and scalable way where we can still get things done. And I suppose feels like architecture, like Georgina mentioned, ecological systems thinking, these are all things that we can draw inspiration from. But there's lots more to figure out and I'm, I suppose, as excited to hear what your perspectives are on that question. So I will leave you on that note. That's all of the stories I have. And um, I suppose my main point here is to kind of um, encourage you to keep going and leveraging our skills um, as designers and our, how we use human stories and uh, I suppose embrace our power of, as designers in this, um, this big paradigm shift that we're in. So thank you.